Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Arturo Casadevall, the chair of the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Casadevall has been writing recently about the potential for using antibodies generated by people who have recovered from infection with the novel coronavirus to prevent infection and even to treat people who are sick. His interest in this idea comes from history, and in particular, the story of how a measles outbreak was stopped in 1934. Let's listen. Dr. Casadeval, thank you so much for joining me. Tell me about this case from 1934. So in the early part of the 20th century, Whenever there were some outbreaks of some viral diseases like measles, mumps, polio, what uh, physicians will do will be to try to stop the outbreak using what is known as convalescent serum. Now, that's a big word, but it's actually simple. Whenever we get better from any type of infections, we make antibodies. And this antibody is protective. And that's why people only catch measles once. Uh, They're protected for the rest of their lives. And what they would do is they would find somebody who was immune, somebody who had recovered from the illness, ask him to donate blood. They would separate the blood and the serum. And then they would give small amounts of serum to people who were vulnerable, that is, those who have been exposed, those who are likely to have caught the disease. And it was quite effective. Uh, It was used to stop many epidemics. And in 1934, it was used to stop an outbreak of measles. Is that right? Exactly. It was used to stop an outbreak of measles in a Pennsylvania preparatory school. Basically, what they had is they had a kid who uh, had a clear exposure to measles. So what they did is they quarantined the boy in the infirmary, but unknown to them, the other two other boys were exposed to measles. And once they realized that, they knew that they were going to be dealing with an epidemic in the class. So uh, they took serum from the boy, and they also reached out to New York State. New York State in those days had laboratories that would prepare serum for exactly for this use. And then they gave this, this serum to 66 other boys. And when you have a disease like measles, approximately 25% of the kids will get it. So measles is even more contagious than the Enormously non- contagious. Yeah, even more so, than the coronavirus. Exactly. Much more on that. It's, it's one of the most contagious infectious diseases that we have. And, and, and what they got was they only three children developed measles, even though the expected numbers would have been maybe a quarter of, of the 66 children. And the, and the measles was very attenuated in the, in the boys that got it, and they commented on that. Meaning they didn't get that sick from the measles. Exactly. They, exactly. They, 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 it was a very mild case. So the boy's antibody that he made when he got better was then administered to his classmates to prevent measles. This was done quite routinely up until the 1940s. And what happened was that they did not know at the time about what is known as blood-borne diseases. They didn't know about hepatitis. They didn't know about other things that could be passed on by the blood. And then once people realized that even though this tend to work, but that there were some risk associated with it, and because vaccines came on board in the 1960s, this practice was essentially both stopped and, f- and forgotten. So we're obviously talking now about the novel coronavirus, and you wrote that you thought that this kind of strategy, maybe pulled from the pages of history, might be helpful here. Could you 
explain a little bit more about that? So exactly, and I, I should mention that we are working here at Hopkins to see if we uh, if we can develop uh, and put in place such a strategy if we need it. So the idea is that many people are going to get coronavirus, and the majority are going to do well. They're going to survive, and they're going to make antibodies to the coronavirus. So their blood has the potential to prevent disease in other people. So if you could take, if you could ask him to donate blood, and you could then take the antibody and you could put it through blood banking practices. By that I mean all the safety protocols that we have in place to make sure that you don't pass any diseases to others. That that blood could be used to prevent disease in in other people that are exposed. For example, healthcare workers, first responders, uh, people carrying for somebody at home uh, who developed coronavirus, small amounts of this serum could stop infections and, and protect people. So you're, you're really focused on people who are exposed but not sick. Is there... No, we are, we are thinking of two protocols. Mm-hmm. We are thinking of a prevention protocol and a therapeutic protocol. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Chinese, uh, there are, even though there are no details coming out of China, one of the things that we have learned is that they are using it. And what we are hearing from contacts is that uh, they're having good results in the treatment of individuals with coronavirus. Can you talk a bit about how well this kind of therapy worked in the old days for treatment um, as well? Was it used for treatment then? So that's a very good question, Josh. Antibody tends to work best in prophylaxis. Meaning prevention. It, it, uh, it doesn't work as well in treatment, and the re- but it does work. It's just that if you, if when you look at the history, the, the, the most striking results are that it can prevent disease. And, and it, there are also striking results because this was uh, antibody therapy was used for many diseases in the pre-antibiotic era. For example, it was used for the treatment of pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia. It was treated for the, uh, for the treatment of streptococcal infections. Uh, And what we learned from that experience was that the earlier you gave it, the better the result. So for example, people who had pneumonia in the 1930s were treated with serum. And the rule was that if you started the serum in the first three days of symptoms, that you got good results. Well, the serum didn't have any value if you gave it later in the in the course of the infection. We don't understand why that is. Mm-hmm. One thought is that to prevent disease, you need very little antibody because the amount of organisms, viruses are very few. Whereas for the treatment, you're gonna need a lot. And therefore it's just hard to give enough antibody. But that's one of the theories out there. What we know is that antibody works much better in prevention than in therapy. That said, it has a role in therapy too. And when you say a, a small amount, can you help me understand like if one person were to donate serum, in theory, how many people could that serum help to protect? So if you go back to those studies in the 1930s and 40s, for example, in, the, in that Pennsylvania school outbreak that I told you about that I mentioned in my Wall Street Journal uh, op-ed, it was uh, between five and 10 uh, milliliters, which is, you know, a, a relatively small amount. And when, when somebody donates serum, is that about that much or it's a little bit they more? They usually give, uh, they may, uh, I actually don't know the number. I'm not a hematologist yeah. transfusion yeah. person, but I think it's in the order of about 300 I milliliters okay. that, that you get. So it is possible that one person donating can protect uh, quite a few people. And, um, where do you think the research, uh, you know, what's the research timeline for something like this in the United States? So this actually does not need a research timeline. What this requires is organization and requires a coordination between transfusion, putting the paperwork together, what is known as an IND, investigation on new drug. Mm-hmm. It requires IRB approval. It requires having the protocols in place. So that is a lot of what we're trying to do. We're trying to coordinate uh, this, something like this has not been done 
in many years. So, um, so in a way, we have to learn from the past and apply it to the present. But the and and I should point out that this will be only a stopgap measure. That we are hopeful that there is some a tremendous amount of research going on to look for drugs that inactivate coronavirus. That there are a lot of research going on to develop monoclonal antibodies, which would be superior to this because with a monoclonal antibody, you could really control the the molecular entity, the the molecule that you're giving, and vaccines. But between now and then, we don't have anything that we can give to our patients or to our healthcare providers to protect them. And this could provide uh, a measure of therapy protection that could be used until better options are available. And I believe better options will be available. I just think that it's going to take months uh, to a year. And so we're working on making this kind of uh, idea a reality, it sounds like. Exactly. I can tell you that at 7 o'clock this morning, nine of us got into a conference call that involved people from hematology, transfusion, infectious disease, and we are coordinating and everyone got their marching orders, what they needed to do. It's complicated. Uh, The transfusion community needs to put the protocols in place. We also would like to have what I call viral neutralization assays in place. What that means is that we would like to know how good is the serum that we get from donors Hmm. uh, so that you basically choose only serum that has high activity because not everybody makes a very high uh, high titer of antibody. So that involves the virology community here that we're working with and, uh, and then the infectious disease community that will be taking care of them. So... People are developing protocols, people having discussions on how to do this at the transfusion level. You want to generate a product right. that can be used. You need to inactivate pathogen attenuation. And, and if, this all, all kind- right, if you're able to launch, get over, you know, bring everyone together, get a protocol, do these things, when in theory do you think uh, these kinds of studies would start? And I mean, I think we should just be clear that what you're talking about is a, a theory that this will work, a theory based on a lot of uh, history and evidence, but nonetheless still a theory until you can actually test it. Is that fair Absolutely. And in fact, we're having a lot of discussions on doing this formally as a, as a randomized clinical trial mm-hmm. so that we can learn from the experience and that we can do things with the most up-to-date clinical research methods available. So you're asking how long will this take? Well, I think that it will be a matter of, of a few weeks, um, in part because uh, it's just the logistics of the organizing. And But, you know, the first people who get coronavirus, this won't, we can't help them. This will right. not work for them. For them, uh, we, only, we can only provide supportive care. Hopefully, we will have a lot of survivors that will get better. And then those will be the people that are in their convalescence will be asked to donate serum. And in, so in, in theory, there'll be a lot of people protocol. like that, right? There'll be a lot of people because there are clearly a lot of people who have relatively mild illness. Exactly. And we need to test them. Uh, but, you know, if this is as predicted, uh, a few in a few weeks, we would probably be able then to to have this in place and, you know, the pay... And at, at least a study started. At least a study exactly. started. Exactly. Well, um. I really wish you the best with this. I really appreciate your taking time from setting this up to explain this. And um, I maybe we'll get a chance to check back in with you uh, on the podcast. That would be great. For those that are interested, I have a paper in press that will be published in mon- on Monday in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, where we, uh, Lisa Porosky in New York and I, wrote out essentially a perspective We have all the references of all the prior studies. We have the references of what is known about coronavirus neutralization, any concerns, any risks. So, and the reason we wrote it was because we are hoping uh, there are a lot of people in the United States that are interested in this, in doing the same thing locally, to provide a document that people could then use in developing their protocols. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Josh. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. 
please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharpstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.